When I was just 13 years old, my father died of silicosis. The disease took about five years to kill him. Not only was it incredibly difficult and slow and painful for him, but we had to watch it. When I get exposed to dust now, and not just silica dust, any dust, it feels like I have a plastic bag around my head and someone's try trying to pull it shut on me. The doctor there told me that um, I should probably seriously consider changing my careers and seeing some specialists. That wasn't good news for me because this is my job, it's what I want to do, and it's all that I know. Obviously, I spent a lot of time on oxygen all night long, and most times during the day. If I'd known it was hurting me, you know, or, or killing me, shoot, I'd have done things a lot different. I had no idea. The history of lung disease among workers caused by exposure to silica is long and storied. About two million construction workers in the U.S. have had occupational exposure to crystalline silica dust. 59,000 of them will develop silicosis and other lung diseases during their lifetime. We've known for decades about how to prevent silica-related diseases. It's not until now that the solutions are mandated by law. Silica is one of the most common minerals on the planet. It's in the sand on our beaches and the quartz of our mountains and land masses. Silica is not dangerous to humans in and of itself. The problems start when we work to manipulate it for our own ends. And that's exactly what happens in construction. When materials that contain silica are disturbed, they generate small particles that can get into your lungs. And once they go in, they don't come out. On a construction site, we find silica in many materials. Here are some of the tasks that disturb silica and make it dangerous for workers. Bricklayers, cement masons, and roofers routinely work with silica materials. Operating engineers and laborers may work with silica materials when moving earth or doing demolition. If you do occasional cutting or drilling as an electrician, sheet metal worker, plumber, or pipe fitter, you may be impacted. And if your work puts you in a dusty area, you need to be aware of your surroundings. Silica is not a recently created hazard. It was first discovered by Hippocrates in about 400 BC. Four centuries later, Pliny the Elder described miners who used forms of respiratory protection. In 1700, Dr. Bernardino Ramazzini identified evidence of silicosis in stonecutters. And in 1860, two English physicians, Peacock and Greenhow, conducted an autopsy of a mason and found a hard, gritty material in his lungs, which they called sand. In the U.S., in 1917, Dr. Alice Hamilton made the connection between the dust that Vermont granite cutters were inhaling and the resulting fatal illnesses. By the 1930s, those workers had successfully bargained for the installation of ventilation equipment in their work sheds. In 1931, the nation's worst industrial disaster took place during the building of a hydroelectric project in West Virginia. 1,500 mostly African-American workers who came north to find work ended up dying in the Hawk's Nest Tunnel disaster. They were ordered to drill through that mountain, and that mountain was made entirely of silica. And they had no meaningful protection at all. And it turned out, by the way, that the employer knew how dangerous it was, because when the engineers and the company representatives went there, they wore masks. So they knew it, but they didn't care about their workers. 476 workers died almost immediately. Many were buried in trenches in a nearby field with just corn stalks for markers. Another 1,500 contracted the disease within two years. I lost three sons from working in the tunnel of silicosis. One is 18, 123, and 121. And I have silicosis myself, and it's impossible for me to get a job anywhere. Else. My husband, Cecil Jones, died of working in the Hawks Nest Tunnel, contracted silicosis. And each and every day that I worked in that tunnel, I have to carry off 10 to 14 men was overcome by the dust. The Hawks Nest tragedy directly connected exposure to silica with silicosis and spurred public outcry for worker protection and workers' compensation. In 1938, then Secretary of Labor Francis Perkins commissioned a study on how to work more safely with silica. After a year of work, the National Silicosis Conference Committee has just made its report 
of findings and recommendations. This report shows how silicosis occurs, where it occurs, and what the disease is, and it makes recommendations for its practical control. Above all, the report emphasizes that these control measures, if conscientiously adopted and applied, that silicosis can be prevented. The 1938 recommendations were to work wet and use vacuums to minimize the dust. Unfortunately, these were merely suggestions and didn't have the teeth of enforcement. Many employers did follow the recommendations until technology advanced, making it possible to work dry. The new methods saved time and money, but caused a renewed increase in silicosis and other lung diseases. In the early days of my career, I never saw a masonry saw that was not water covered. We, we couldn't. The blades would fall apart if they weren't wet. Since the, uh, the wet dry blade came into effect, hey, the water stops going, we keep right on cutting. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration wasn't established until 1971. That year, OSHA mandated a limit for the amount of silica a worker could be exposed to, but it didn't go far enough. We already knew that the standard that went in place back in the early 70s was out of date the day it went into place. Fast forward to 2016. After decades of trying, OSHA finally released a federal standard lowering the exposure limit by more than half and creating a series of recommendations for how to work safely with silica. The Labor Department is announcing a final silica rule that updates the standards, saving more than 600 lives per year and protecting the health of thousands of others. The recommendations are essentially the same ones they made in 1938 work wet and use vacuums to eliminate or reduce dust at its source. It took nearly 80 years to get federal protection from silica, but now that it's in place, we need to use it. Workers need to learn more about the hazard and use the recommended controls. Always be aware of your surroundings and the work being done by other crafts and take care not to bring the dust home on your clothes or person. Contractors must designate a competent person to control and monitor for silica on the job. Make sure your workers are using vacuums, water, substitutes, ventilation, or different work practices, and provide respiratory protection when needed. Too many workers have died from silica for too many years. We can work safely with silica. Let's do it.